Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the uh, this upcoming webinar. We're so excited to have you. Uh, this is called Unleashing the Potential of AI in Healthcare Innovation, uh, co-hosted by the Social Innovation Summit and our friends and really great partners at Amazon Web Services. So thank you all for joining us. My name is Zach Miller. I lead programming for the Social Innovation Summit. Wonderful uh, to meet you all, to have you all here today. And I'm honored to be your MC uh, to guide us today. So uh, for those of you who are not yet familiar with Social Innovation Summit, we're a platform that throughout the year elevates groundbreaking ideas and innovative leaders who are changing the world for the better. At our core, the SAS mission is to drive impact through partnerships. We convene key stakeholders at events large and small throughout the year. We connect individuals and brands and ideas through curated programming and networking. And finally, through that process, we catalyze lasting partnerships. And, and that's really what we're about. Later this year, we'll be hosting our largest gathering of the SIS community at our annual flagship event, taking place June 4th and 5th in the great city of Chicago. And I hope to see you all there in person. But for today, as part of our annual series of events, I'm honored to welcome you to this exciting webinar we're hosting proudly alongside our friends at AWS. Focusing on the trends and opportunities for harnessing data and technology and AI to advance strategic and operational goals, we'll hear from an esteemed group of healthcare innovation leaders, including Joey Johnson, Chief Information Security Officer for Premise Health, Dr. Nikhil Bakta, Director of Sub-Saharan Africa Region for St. Jude Global, Ritesh Patel, Senior Partner for Global Digital Health at Finn Partners, and Georgia Thomas, Health Executive Advisor for AWS. Now, before we jump in, just a couple housekeeping items. First, if you'd like to turn on closed captioning, just navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window and select Show Captions. Uh, second, our speaker today will be accepting questions from the audience. We're gonna be doing live Q&A towards the end of the discussion. So we highly, highly encourage you throughout the discussion, submit your questions through the Zoom Q&A function. Um, and our, our team will, will get those over to the moderator and we'll have some, some live Q&A. All right, so with that, I'm pleased to welcome to the stage our uh, great partner and great friend, Georgia Thomas, to kick off today's session. Georgia, over to you. All right. Thank you, Zach. I appreciate it. Um, welcome, everyone, and welcome to the Healthcare Innovation Unleashing the Potential for AI. Uh, we um, here at AWS or Amazon Web Services, um, you'll hear us call it AWS quite frequently. Uh, I am a healthcare executive advisor, nurse by training, have been a nurse for over 27 years now, and um, am ecstatic about this conversation. When we really are as healthcare leaders, um, you are wor working every day to answer this question. How do we improve the quality, effectiveness, efficiencies in healthcare in a way that is equitable and inspires hope for our workforce? We have seen that technology paired with human experience can transform care delivery and accelerate discovery of treatments and cures. And with the digital cloud technology having given rise to tools like predictive analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and now of course, generative AI, or also called Gen AI. The capabilities of technology to help us on this mission just keep getting stronger. Like the internet, generative AI will impact every aspect of our lives and probably already does without us knowing it, um, including how we deliver care, it is, has the ability to turn large volumes of data into actionable information at rapid speed. This opportunity to accelerate everything we do from research to automated administrative tasks, detecting early stage cancers, and even real-time suicide prevention. AWS supports any size of organization today from Geisinger Health System, and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and Greenwood Genetic Center, helping guide the purposeful, secure, and effective use of data in cloud computing to accelerate critical care outcomes and improve the patient experience. But first, we have to start with the data. 
And in my career as a nurse, I've always had problems getting some of the data that I wanted, or at least I thought I did. So ultimately, data is that foundation and your differentiator. By putting a focus on the data, you can then apply technologies. It has to be that infrastructure for you. Um, analytics, machine learning, AI, all depend on these large data sets. Organizations can unlock more opportunities to solve those complex challenges that exist in the care delivery and healthcare research. Your data is the difference between a general generative AI application and one that truly knows your organization, your population, and your mission that can leverage that securely and responsible. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. What, um, with AWS, generative AI services, applications built on Amazon Bedrock, for example, um, help healthcare organizations and hospitals, they can infuse that predictivity across all of their operations from content generation to information summaries and digital assistance. You can personalize your patient engagement, enhance your fundraising opportunities and operations, and accelerate data-driven decisions. We have to acknowledge that it absolutely needs to be responsible use of AI, and we remain aware of the risks that are out there, the potential bias, the toxicity, and the inequity. At AWS, we are committed to developing AI responsibly and taking a human-centric approach to promoting that safe, responsible use of AI as a force for good. Ultimately, we want to help you implement the right solutions and apply the right services so that you can generate the results you need no matter where you are in the cloud journey. So today's agenda, we have uh, designed um, the program to speak to these challenges and opportunities through the voice of leaders like you. Um, and what matters most is how organizations like yours can learn from each of these panelists about the value of the cloud. And also keep thinking of questions that come up, put those in uh, the Q&A, and uh, we'll try to get to, to some of those towards the end as we speak um, to our panelists. All right, so um, I'm going to have the panelists um, introduce themselves and then we're going to go through a couple of questions that each of them are going to have um, some discussion around. So uh, uh, if um, before as we kick this off, um, I'll start with Dr. Butka, but could you give um, a talk about a little bit about yourself, your role and how you're setting the foundation for innovation in healthcare and how does that intersect with the use of AI, ML, and, in, and generative AI? Sure, thanks Georgia and thanks to everybody for this opportunity to present. Um, so my name is Nikhil Bhatta, I'm a pediatric oncologist at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Um, I see patients currently with leukemias and lymphomas, so I still practice clinically, but about 80% of my time is actually focusing on the global health problems really facing children with cancer. And so as part of my work within the Sub-Saharan African um, region, one of the challenges that I have every week is the constant concern that, are we getting the diagnosis right? And so at St. Jude, we're really privileged to really brag about a couple of key innovations that we've had over the last 50 years. One of them being that, you know, for the basic diagnosis of leukemia, for example, we developed the immunophenotyping methods that are currently used. And so 40 years later, we constantly talk about like, this is like one of our major contributions. Yet every week, I still get a call from our colleagues in Africa saying they don't have access to immunophenotyping. So how can they make this diagnosis? And so we see that as both like, yes, we're advancing science, but we're not advancing care. And so the other great thing that we're proud of is the fact that every child who comes into St. Jude you know, we think back to the 1990s and the Human Genome Project, 10 year process to sequence six individuals. Now every child that comes into St. Jude gets their entire genome sequence, not just once, but twice, the cancer and the germline. And so we can offer that as a way about actually figuring out what is the precise cause of their cancer and what precise treatments can we give? And so that led to a question, why do we continue to allow that disparity to exist? If we have the, the methods, the informatics, how can we accelerate this? And so really it's not even a matter of cost anymore. 
it's a matter of informatics. It's a matter of the classification tools. And it's really just thinking about how can we take the leap to put clinical grade classification into a cloud environment, which may not make me very popular with some of the, the lawyers that we have here at St. Jude, um, but we've worked through it. And so we've really developed and are working now to put together a platform which leverages AWS as a mechanism to ensure that, because sites all over the world with COVID, with HIV are sequencing. So can we ensure that we're doing quality sequencing, upload that into a cloud environment, run the classifiers that we've developed over the last decade here at St. Jude, return those results back and get that done in less than a day? And the answer is yes, that works. So now it's a matter of figuring out how to implement that and starting to address the clinical need and also that other issue, which is that we lament as, as, as researchers that 90% of the genomes out there are from Northern European populations. And that means we love to talk about that problem, but nobody's actually solving it. So this is our way of by marrying the clinical with allowing for secondary use of research and federated data, data sets that allows through some of the architecture we can build in AWS, we can start to address these, um, these fundamental disparities, both on the research and on the clinical side. Thank you, Dr. Botka. That's great. Uh, uh, Ratesh, how about you? Give a little bit about yourself, your role, and the, the innovation in healthcare. Yeah, Ritesh Patel. I run the digital health practice here at Finn. We work with health systems, pharma companies, startups, device manufacturers, uh, anything related to innovation and digital health. And the work we've been doing really is around understanding how AI can change the model, for example, for a delivery of care or change the way we engage with physicians and patients and how do we enhance that conversation between the two. So that's been my narrow focus. My view is if it moves, digitize it. So I have a very narrow view of what I can do. So thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Joey, you're up next. Sure. Thanks everyone for, for having me for your time today. Uh, I'm Joey Johnson. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer uh, with Premise Health. So, you know, we do we do direct primary care for, for large employer groups. So we spend a lot of time, uh, I've been serving in this capacity for 14 years. So while, while I hold the sort of security governance title, um, uh, I am an executive leader and, and, and uh, champion of our, of our data program, our AI Center of Excellence, a lot of things like that. So, you know, we look broadly at, at the data sets that are coming in. I mean, the, I think the foundational underpinning in, in Georgia, you, you kind of stated foundations to begin with, is, is really looking at what are the foundations we have and, and where is the data quality there? And then how do we use that to sort of empower new insights? I think the one biggest lesson we've learned on our journey, you know, AI and engine AI are, are all the, the hot topic right now, but I think us, like a lot of the panelists here, I mean, we've been we've been using AI modeling for, for some years now. It's not it's not brand new. And one of the things you learn on that journey is really that a couple of things. You know, data is not a static asset, it's a dynamic asset. And the way that you model it like a piece of clay is is really going to drive you where you're going to go. And and you're only limited by your creativity. But that inherently obviously is in my chair comes with comes with a lot of social responsibility, right? There's a lot that you have to look at and understand and really build those foundations up front um, to make sure that you are being responsible uh, in anticipation of sort of regulation, everything that's to come, but also making sure that you know you're you're doing the right things and really looking through the right lens. Um, Dr. Bakta, I mean, you, you brought up a great point, right? I mean, there's so much, uh, you know, Northern European data out there that you know as you start to drive into data and insights. You know, in our organization, we look and say, hey, well, where are the blind spots? We're like, where is the bias? And like, what, what are the things that it's not telling us? And how do we go find that? Thank you, Joey. Uh, really important points. Um, I think this conversation is going to continue around our data sets. Um, but uh, so, Dr. Baca, I want to switch back over to you now and really talk about um, how have you started laying that foundation for technology-driven innovation at St. Saint, Saint Jude's? You talked a little bit about that, but one of the things I would say is, right, AIML is not new. We've, it's been around 20 years. I know there's uh, people use it in its different ways. Gen AI is the new buzzword, um, and, and there's a lot to do with it. So what, what is uh, on the roadmap uh, for technology-driven innovation at St. Jude's? Yeah, no, I mean, I think there's a there's a lot that's happening at St. Jude, and so I certainly can't cover that breadth. But I think that if we just limit the scope to some of the diagnostic pieces, 
you know, it's funny that science and technology often outpaces human capacity to accept it. And that's probably the biggest barrier that we have. And on two fronts, I would say, um, we as clinicians sometimes get wary of new technologies and new methods, regardless of what the science may say or what the data may say. We've done something, we've done it well for the last 30 years, why do you wanna change? So this concept of de-implementation, this concept of how do you change behavioral habits in a, in a structured health system to embrace and, and accept. And, and you know, we, we, we have to accept that, you know, the Theranos example is out there, the IBM Watson example is out there, and folks are going to look at this with, with that eye, and so then you have to be able to speak to address those. So there's that element of it. But then the, the interesting side is that, you know, at, a, at an institute like St. Jude, we are St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. We drive research. And in the space of genomics, we actually live in what's an interesting time in that we're in the middle of like the semi-Cold War. Because with the United States, with many academic institutions here, Canada, Europe, everybody is interested in sequencing deeper, sequencing broader, sequencing more modalities, the proteome, the metabolome, the you know, whole genome, and so and integrating that data. But we're forgetting as clinicians that I can't use all of that data just to make this the decision of how to treat the child in front of me. I may need only one to two percent of that information. And can we start to actually leverage cheaper, simpler techniques to address the challenge at a global level. So bringing equity back into the conversation and back to the research agenda that it, what we're doing does not have to necessarily be pushing only the frontiers of science, but sometimes bringing that science back to the clinical side. So I think, you know, as we begin to think about those, you know, we, we have to break through a lot of those issues. And then the last is, frankly, the regulatory environment here is dynamic. You know, Data is dynamic, and I totally agree with what Joey said, but at the same time, we're living in a part, at a time when not only in the United States, but if you think about the global architecture on data privacy, you know, Europe has obviously been leading the way with GDPR. We're starting to see some of the activities here. Others are adopting that language, and then you see um, Asian countries and others that may be going one step further, and you'll end up with hospitals that are like clinical, clinical colleagues, ministries of health, who don't even know how to interpret their own laws. And as you can imagine, safety is what folks will regress to. So how do we then figure out ways that we can not necessarily circumvent, but work within the blurry lines and, and then also educate teams about their own local regulations as well. So it's in, in a lot of cases, a lot of what we do is more um, technology diplomacy rather than um, the AI parts in some ways, the easier part to this question. Agree. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I want to um, ask uh, Ritesh and Joey to answer a little bit about this, but St. Jude has made a lot of progress in the data strategy, health innovation, AI, ML space. Can you tell us more about the that what has enhanced the work across across lines of business and care for you? And Joey, I'll start with you. You know, I, I, absolutely. I think everyone kind of wants to jump on the the AI, Gen AI train. Uh, and I think when I talk to a lot of colleagues, universal, they all kind of feel like they're behind, right? Like, like they need to be doing some catch up and they, and they miss the train a little bit. But the reality of the matter is, you know, on our journey, um, it started as kind of a data topic, but very, very quickly, we realized um, this is an interdepartmental alignment initiative. And it, it was actually very business transformative. Uh, change the way that we look at, at our at our future and how we handle data and how we process it. But the biggest thing that we really realized early on, and Dr. Bhakti, you brought up some some great specific use cases. We've kind of centered back to what is the use case that you want with this data? For us, you know, uh, the enterprise data governance function, and I, I saw some questions coming on the QA of how do you regulate and govern it, right? You've got to do that not based on just the regulation that you know, but what you anticipate to be coming, which inherently means you know you you need to be behaving appropriately in an anticipatory fashion in advance of that. So we had to build a structure that solved a couple things out of the gate. One was just the basic data quality foundations and understanding can you identify what the data is, how you tag it, and and that it's useful. Um, and and that requires discipline. It's it's not something folks love to hear. They want to go, how do I get from step one to step ten really quickly? But at the end of the day, I mean, you know, uh, 
if, if you're parsing a, a, a landfill um, and you use AI to do it, you'll still get a bunch of trash back to you really, really quickly with lots of different options of what you can do with it. Um, and so we really had to focus in on what are the data, like what do we really want to see? What do we really want to prove? And on top of it, as the humans who kind of know the data and the theses, can we go back and say, hey, this doesn't look right? Like this, this is this is not producing the results that I want. Either the data we got is bad or 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 something that we need to correlate. Um, and what we learned really quickly was that discipline up front is is really is really hard. And it takes longer to get through use cases one through three than you know four through ten thousand because you have to build these foundations. Um, and you know, AI and then Gen AI are kind of the top of that pyramid. Um, but it, but it really takes a little bit of time and dedication and alignment interdepartmentally to kind of to kind of get there, right? I mean, we would say we create called it like a data marketplace, and you know we would say, hey, I have some assumptions as a security person or legal or or medical ops or whoever, and we had to all kind of get in the room. Honestly, some of it was just making sure we were talking the same language at the same time in the same way. And once we kind of cracked through some of those pieces, then we were really cooking with gas. But I mean, it did take some discipline and patience and alignment to get there. Thank you, Joey. Very insightful. Ritesh? I think, you know, the issues that have already been raised are good ones. I think Gen AI has just elevated it all. AI has been in the industry for for a while now. If you look at radiology departments, you know, those machines have got algorithms in them to allow the radiologist to phone in on a specific image, right? Um, there have been deployments in places, whether it's pharma who's been using it for clinical trials and clinical recruitment, as well as, you know, molecular discovery, for example, uh, where it took hundreds of scientists to do stuff. The machine is doing it first, and then the scientists are taking over afterwards globally. So I think Gen AI has just elevated it and made it more consumer oriented. We've always had it, let's say five, six years, maybe 10 years in some cases. So the guidance I, we sort of give is what's the governance model and what's your strategy? What are you trying to do? It doesn't fit all, right? There are some departments could never you know, use AI, for example, but there are others who could. And then what is that overall framework you'll use to deploy is who are the stakeholders that you need to bring together because it is, to Joey's point, interdepartmental. You've all got to be talking the same language. Otherwise, your version of AI and Dr. Bata's version of AI and Joey's version of AI are going to be totally different. So are we heading in the right direction? And then you can talk about, okay, how do we do it? What's the things we need to do? And obviously data is very important. The cleanliness of the data, where you point it to, the kinds of things you use it for, et cetera, afterwards. So there's a huge opportunity, I think, but to Joey's point, you can't go from one to 10 straight away. You've got to put, you know, put the path together for sure. Thank you. I, I would say that a lot of uh, folks that I've talked to, when they talk about wanting Gen AI and you look at use cases, they probably really just need AI or ML, not even the generative part. So really also that education, the knowledge behind that is is very important as well, in my opinion. Yeah, well, but this, oh, this isn't very yeah. wild. You know, I started out in travel many, many, many years ago, and I was mm -hmm. deploying inference engines on sequent machines to age myself. And that just takes a huge amount of data to then do inference, you know, and then somebody said, oh, that's AI, right? So I think we just keep going. And I think Generative has just elevated it to the consumer world more than anybody else, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so I'm going to switch. This is to all three of you, and we'll start with Ritesh uh, this time. Um, really, when, just quickly, what are two to three things you're really excited about um, next? And what's uh, once you have the foundation set, what kind of true innovation in healthcare will be powered by technology? Just some Gosh, that's... Here. <laughs> Tell you what, if I knew the answer to those things, then I'd be sitting on a beach in Jamaica, right, <laughs> with a yacht somewhere. So, look, there are there is there is huge opportunity for healthcare. We have to be careful, right? Because unlike you know consumer goods or any of these industries that are deploying these things, people could die if you do it badly. That's the big premise here, right? So we've got to be very careful. But the areas that I think are doing really well are physician productivity. Right. If you can have use cases to Joey's point around, can I use this kind of 
capability to maybe summarize things, right? I saw an, I saw a great use case where a summarization of the patient record for the physician before the patient walks into the door. So you're not spending hours, you know, flipping through screens for at least three, four minutes before you start talking to the patient. Patient's sitting there in front of you while you're looking in your computer or your tablet trying to figure out what did I do, what was the prescription, whatever it is, right? So that kind of thing would really help me with a little pop-up that pops up on the screen that says, here's the summary. That this all, this is what they had, this is the medications they're on, this was the last thing you did, right? Really, really cool. The other area is around managing the uh, the back office infrastructure or processes. You know, discharge is another one I've seen where there is a current process of you call all the patients. You've got a list, pick up the phone, and you ring them and say, how are you doing? Well, the AI algorithm now says pay attention to the top three. These are the three you really need to pay attention to. So things like that I get excited about. And I think those are the kinds of things we should focus on initially. The bigger ones, pharmaceuticals, I'm seeing a huge amount of new ways of figuring out rare diseases and molecules for rare diseases, right? Using AI as a way to start looking at all of the publications out there in the world and then coming through and saying, listen, this one looks really interesting. I've also, you know, there are new companies that are popping up around reuse of products, right? repurposing drugs for new mechanisms of action, which is quite fascinating, which never would have been uh, allowed or enabled until AI came along and the machines were able to do the kinds of things we're doing. So that whole rare disease area, which has been woefully thin in, in uh, drug discovery, I think is going to be exploding in the next couple of years. There you go. Hopefully that helps. Thank you, Ritesh. No, that's yeah. wonderful. All right. Uh, Dr. Bakke, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll take this in a couple of different ways. So I, I do think that, you know, as Ritesh mentioned, that you're starting to see some of this make its way into the clinic in places like radiology and elsewhere. And I do think that, you know, it's in some ways it's old hat in terms of people have been talking about it, but it's still not being used, frankly, at least not at scale. So I do think that as people start to catch up with some of the, the regulations and some of the comfort levels and get clinicians who are trained in this, you'll start to see more and more of those activities. I think cloud-based computing structures, which, you know, there's a there's a really cool work out of MD Anderson, whereby teams from all over the world can upload imaging from uh, wherever they may be, and then actually get radiation oncology plans that actually would be utilized for patient level uh, treatment. And that really cuts out some of the challenges that you have, which is a lack of a health workforce to really do that planning and, and, and actually deliver that care. So I think innovations are gonna be trying to not just do the trite thing of leapfrogging, but actually um, addressing where there are true deficiencies in the healthcare workforce or there are bottlenecks in the workforce. But uh, to answer that question also in another way, I think where you're starting to also see pop up more and more um, kind of what, and I see this in the research environment when I review grants and stuff, um, you see more natural language processing or chatbot kind of like, oh, I'm gonna be able to do this with no real business use case of what that is that they're actually going to do with it. Like, I'm gonna create a text message that reminds a patient to do such and such, but like, they're just gonna turn it off or they're just gonna like, they'll respond for like the first, like maybe two or three, and then they're just gonna be like, swipe. So these are the kinds of, there's all of these kind of like nuisance type of ideas that folks haven't really thought about like, okay, you know, just putting your chatbot in just because it's cool and it's been in the news for the last year doesn't mean it's actually going to solve patient problems. Um, and so that's where I do think that, you know, we're going to start to see that fade as people realize that that's not going to be the end all solution. And we need to really think about ways that integrate into regular use cases that affect that are part of our regular daily lives. And that's hard because our daily lives continue to evolve as we get more AI tools built into our iPhones and into our into our every everyday app environment. So I think some of this is gonna be an interesting evolution. Agree, agree. Thank you, Dr. Batka. I think um, it's interesting. One of our uh, leadership principles here at AWS is working backwards. And in my prior roles in quality, we always wanted to start from what is the problem or what was the bad outcome or the positive outcome? And then how did we get there and work backwards to understand what is um, get closest to the patient, closest to the customer, 
uh, and figure out it that way instead of trying to design something and then saying, here it is, and we don't even know what we're trying to solve for. Yep. I think I would challenge people on the call to think about it from a, what can I do to increase productivity for a physician or a nurse or people? Because this tool could allow us to do that in really amazing creative ways. And then how can I enhance that and use that to your point around text messaging, right? I'm mm -hmm. getting sick and tired of the press gainy messages. How was the service? What did you do? I'm you're right, I'll turn it off. So what, how can we use this tool sets to increase that patient-physician mm -hmm. engagement and dialogue, right? Uh, that's really interesting that we could do something like that as well. That would be fantastic, I think. Uh, ambient right. coming through, right? We're now looking yeah. at, you know, all the ambient stuff that's happening and how can we take those transcripts and marry them with the EHR mm -hmm. and come up with a new way of engaging with a patient-physician, right? Absolutely. Thank you. All right, Joey. What about you? What's what's next? You know, I I actually uh, agree with 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 what uh, both doctors on, on the line have said, and and I think it comes back to kind of use cases, right? I mean, there's so much that you can do, and like to my earlier um, analogy, it's it's like a ball of clay and how you want to mold it, and only your creativity holds you back, um, but but only your your data capability and um, maturity is really what's going to drive you forward to your point about kind of working backwards. And so I think that if every organization, because the big question is, hey, what's the coolest thing that I can do with AI right now? Like, what should I go out and figure out? I think it's like, if you pull it back to your organization and, and your focus and what you think is your differentiator that really drives you and said, what if we could do X, Y, Z that we were never capable of doing before? Um, that's where you start to really see things getting traction and working. And the reason is because as powerful as the technology is, the humans behind it that really understand all the moving parts are the ones that can look at that and go, oh, wow, now we really have new insights. It's about where you get new data insights that really drives the power. You know, sometimes we would, we would take things and say, what would this look like? What would, what would solving this problem look like in a manufacturing or transportation industry? How would they solve a similar kind of problem? And the insights you get are really, really impactful. Um, even for us, you know, we looked at it and said in, in our business model as primary care delivering to large employer groups, sure, we do primary care. We also have pharmacies. We also have fitness centers. And we said, hey, you know, could we actually reduce how much um, medicine people are relying upon and the cost centers associated to that by changing behaviors in areas that we know are what are driving costs? I mean, everyone wait, you know, shock and all, America's diet is not the greatest in the world and neither is the health condition, right? And, and there's a lot of primary care gaps. And we said, you know, what are the best ways we could positively affect the patient, positively affect the cost model and, and really drive it? And we came up with a whole bunch of theories and said, let's set to prove those out, right? And, and that's because that's what our business is and our business model is. And we found some really interesting things. And sometimes the data indicated what we thought and, and sometimes it, it did, right? The, the trends were really, really interesting. You marry that with other things that we want to prove out around social determinants of health and what are happening in underserved populations and all of these things. You know, it's not a one size fits all. So I think it's easy to have conjecture about all the crazy places the future could go and all the world peace and world hunger that you can solve. But you you really have to kind of think of it a little bit differently as to, hey, and where we sit on our place in the ecosystem, what massive advance could we really drive if we weren't hindered by what we could know? Uh, and then and, and, and start there. And as you go on that journey, you kind of start to discover your blind spots or where your data isn't good and you kind of work on them. And that's why everybody, I think, on this panel keeps talking about the foundations. It's just something you continually build on. Sorry, just to jump on, because Joey mentioned it earlier, and I think it's worth mentioning it again in the context of this discussion. You know, what's really going to drive this is going to be more of a team science based approach, you know, it, and that, again, nothing new, but maybe, and maybe it's because of the millennial in me coming out. But the reality is, you know, as a physician sitting here, like the things that I'm working on couldn't happen if I didn't have a computational biologist on my right side, a molecular pathologist on my right left side speaking to like, this is going to make my job easier. The computational biologist saying like, well, here's the tools that I can do. And the clinician saying that, like, this is why it matters to the patient. And so as we've developed this, almost all of the activities that I do, and this I only speak of one of them, but really team-based approaches that involve end users in some way, the actual uh, the generative or whatever form of machine learning processes that you're doing on this side with kind of those intermediaries. That's 
the only way. We have kind of a concept. We have we basically talk about it as you need your content experts, which is where you know yes, most of the folks that are developing the machine learning pieces that are doing the generative AI, but you need your context experts. And a lot of times we take those for granted. And you got to have that bilateral discussion, and you got to put everybody in the room speaking the same language before you can really move anything positively forward. The machines will help you scale that as well, Dr. Bakhtar, right? Yeah. That's the beauty of this thing, right? So you can actually start getting teams to be able to do bigger things as well as part of this. Your computational biologists will be able to look at data sets that never had access to before, right? Yeah, compounds. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, great. Well, we probably could continue this all day long um, with the conversation, but there there are some questions and I'm going to pull a couple of those out. Uh, and uh, thank you for an amazing panel so far. This has been wonderful. Um, one of the first questions is if AI is going to require huge data sets, but healthcare data privacy is such a core principle here in the U.S. and elsewhere as well. Um, at least, how is healthcare AI going to acquire and use data without violating the law? Joey, do you want to take that from a CISO perspective? Sure. Um, you know, I, I would say, again, this, this kind of goes back to what is your data discipline before you throw it into an AI ML engine or machine, right? And, and what I mean by that specifically is when we started on our journey, we said, hey, we got lots of data in lots of places. We don't want to build a new data warehouse. What we want to do is get to what's really critical where. And it involved organizational transformation. For example, you know, our privacy office would say, hey, you know, everything that's in the Epic EMR is inherently HIPAA regulated data. No, it's, no, it's, no, it's not. If all I need to know, we've got 850 sites, is the site address of these clinics. That's not, right? And so we learned very early on, we actually had to go on literally almost like a field by field level and say, what is this data asset? Run it through legal compliance regulatory, come up with the rules of what can happen with this data asset and field, and then move it into a producer consumer market that actually all the rules and enforcements will follow, right? And then you build audit models that can come and say, hey, is the machine really doing what it's supposed to do? Again, that's foundations that take discipline and time to build. But if you do it that way, it really facilitates a lot of things. It facilitates you broadening um, who your data scientists can be, what the levels of access can be, because you can de-identify in really sensitive ways. You can prove it out and you can say, hey, you know, it, it enabled a bi-directional conversation with us and our clinical teams and our ops teams to say, hey, what do you really need to prove out? And do you need to know that it's Joey Johnson? Do you need to know the age? Do you, like, do you actually need these fields? And what we found in the 80-20 rule was 80% of the time, no. To prove the thesis, you didn't need almost any of that. And then you would get to some outcomes and deeper insights and go, okay, we think we've proved our theory. Now we kind of need to look at it with actual real data. And then that steps into another land where you say, okay, here are the regulatory constraints that follow it. Whether those are established regulations or those you set up internally as an organization with a responsible one. And for us, that runs through very specific legal privacy compliance review uh, a, a review of, you know, what are the bias implications here? All of those things before we, I mean, we have stages of what we call use cases to say, you're basically always dealing with the identified sensitive data that we have enforced to be that way until such time as there's a true justification for it. And then and then on those use cases, everything follows. I mean, and I think that follows a lot of what the other panelists were really saying is, you know, if you put those foundations in place, it can you can appropriately and in a responsible way navigate those waters but you, but you can't do it retroactively. I, I think there's only one more thing, if I may, to add to that, which is what's internal use, right? Because you already have access to a lot of that. And what's external use? And if you're going to supply data to a partner to do something with it, then it has to be de-identified, right? You cannot violate those HIPAA regulations that you have. And then you start from there. Right. Why to Joey's point? Why do you need it? Why do you need the zip code? Why do you need whatever, whatever, whatever? So I would also encourage people to think of it that way as well, internal versus external. Thank you. All right. The next question is what are the primary concerns regarding the ethical implications of using AI in healthcare decision making processes? Dr. Baca, you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's sim as simple as we just don't know. It's the it's the wild west, 
you know, some of the work that we're actually doing right now is actually going to patients and families and actually asking them from their perspective, what do they understand about what's being utilized in terms of the decisions that are that are being made on the back end for them and how much transparency do they want in that? How much awareness do they want in that, um, et, et cetera? And I think that that's gonna be a moving target. Society is evolving and it, it's gonna be generational. It's gonna be, and it's gonna be different populations. And ultimately, I think that this is going to this is going to be um, something where we there's not going to be absolute normative guidance that we can provide. But I think what that what we can say is that in those decision making processes, ensuring transparency and engagement of the end users, in this case, patients, has to be a part of that to retain trust, because it, it all comes back down to are patients trusting what they're getting out of that result. And I mean that and not just in terms of what they're getting in terms of the results of the diagnosis or the clinical outcome, but actually how their data then is being leveraged or utilized in other contexts. And so I think just back to the last question as well, because it fits in, you know, we have to still, regardless of generative AI, regardless of unstructured data sets, um, we're still going to have to put in that hard work about normative data efforts at data architecture. We're not going to get away from having those discussions and just saying that we throw everything into a bowl and then like let this all get mixed and then somehow it all tastes great. We've got to, we've, we're still gonna have to put in some of those infrastructure pieces moving forward for exactly this purpose. I heard a great quote the other day. Someone said, I'm, I've got a data lake already and I've got all these data sets. I'm now creating data ponds where people can have access to use for AI. <laughs> right? So maybe we'll have a new vernacular coming along. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you. On what Dr. Bhakta ju ju just said, um, because I think it's really critical. Everyone always asks the question, how are you going to handle ethics in a way that you're right and you don't get yourself in trouble? And, and, and it's true. We're not going to get prescriptive guidance. But what we do know is, you know, when privacy is in the eye of the beholder, what, what my grandmother considers private information is very, very vastly different from what my niece does. Uh, she will put things out on social media that my grandmother would never have imagined anyone would talk about outside of the dining room, right? So um, you have to be forward looking. And, and when we look back at the lessons learned uh, uh, internationally from, from the leveraging and use of social media that 10 years, 15 years later, everybody goes, hey, you should have known better. You, you should have done better on the privacy front with how you were handling that data. And I think that a lot of organizations are looking at that now and saying, hey, you know, as we start to do this, what is our ethical and moral obligation? They should be doing that. If they're not going to do that, they're going to get in trouble. But I think a lot of mature, responsible organizations are asking those questions. Um, I tend to believe that, you know, lead organizations are developing best practices uh, and risk management scenarios before there's a blueprint or, or an instructive guide for how to do it, right? And then over a period of time, that becomes best practice. And over a period of time, best practice makes its way into a compliance framework or a regulatory mandate or something. But the lead organizations are kind of driving that path. And, and you have to have that. Moment. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. And I feel like this is a, a really good one. Um, how do you ensure there is no biased data feeding the AI platform? I'm going to let whomever wants to start. Probably the toughest thing to tackle in any program that you do. Um, it is it is inherent and you have to be mindful of it, but you have to plan for it ahead of time. It'll never be foolproof. There's no silver bullet that says this is completely non-biased in any way, shape or form. So anybody who comes into your offices or calls you and says, I've got that silver bullet, send them my way so I can buy them a drink and have a chat with them, right? Because... Uh, it's a long way to go, I think. You know, you can do as much as you can by, to Joey's point, data sets, right? Make sure you have the most diverse sorts of data that you can get to to build those algorithms that you're going to build or do you point to, to you know, do something about. But I haven't seen any model out there yet that says this is 100% not going to be biased in any way, shape or form. I fully agree with Ritesh. I I think that there's also a, a mandate, which is that as data scientists, it's not just only about taking the data sets that you have or trying to, we need to start actually creating and collecting that with intent and purpose. So that gets, again, back to equity, uh, back to innovative ways to collect that data. So, you know, again, I talked about Northern European populations being 90%. 
We continue to have that problem 10 years later. No one's solving for it. Well, the way to solve for it is actually start making it clinically applicable and then utilizing that data on the back end. So then that generates new ways and new opportunities to do this. So we can't just sit back and then accept the bias, which is important, and then own the bias. We have to actually start to solve for the bias. And that that's where I would say data scientists need to just stop only thinking about the data set that's in front of them, but how do they create the next data set or be a part of the solution to solve for that next data set. And probably look for it as well, right, Dr. Baxter? You know, there are tools that you can use to sort of potentially find but potential bias and mitigate it. So if you're the data scientist, you should use those tools as well to ensure that you've got it as close to as good as you can get it, right? Absolutely. I mean, you, you, doing responsible work is for sure a, a kind yeah. of an underpinning of all of that. But like, if you make that supposition that everybody's going to be acting in an ethical fashion and in well. a rigorous fashion, <laughs> yeah. then it's that only gets you so far. Now let's actually go out and solve it. Stop That's talking true. about the problem. True. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we got almost the entire way through the webinar without without getting into the dropping the four letter word of, of bias, but we've we've arrived here. And you know, I think one thing that I would that would throw into there is sometimes, uh, and this could be controversial, you you don't want to get rid of bias. Bias isn't inherently bad; it can be right. It can it can lead you to conclusions that are improper and and indeliberate. But you may actually want to, in a data science modality have some degree of bias influencing results to say, what would happen if we looked at the data in this way, in a way that we've never looked at it before? Does that does that work? Does that change anything, right? We're looking at this population and what their traditional diet is. What happened if we use data and threw this at it? What would happen? Now, you you can't take that and, and draw conclusions to earlier comments. I mean, we have a, a responsibility, but but that's there. And, and I think that the other thing is, you just have to be cognizant proactively about the bad bias and, and where that could drive you. When you're looking at use cases, you should be able to say, hey, what are the areas that I'm really concerned with this coming back and giving me some information that's going to be biased in a way that I don't want? Um, and, and that is, you know, I mean, that's on the onus of the organization. Uh, Dr. Bakhti, you just said, I mean, it'd, it'd be great if we believed that everyone was super ethical all the time. Um, we, we know that's not true, but it's going to be on the organization to, to, to drive that. And it gets back to the point of, because you're right, it's all about intentionality. And so, you know, if you have that data set, go out and find somebody who at least understands that data set in terms of the actual contextual application of it. And then maybe just have a beer with them or talk to them and try to build them as a collaborator and actually then understand the underpinnings of what you're actually analyzing. I think we've all seen, it's the, you know, again, over the set, but it's true, garbage in, garbage out. Well, you know, the way to address that is start to understand what it is that you're processing in the first place and intentionally work through the biases so that your work, that as the best you can, you, just, you start to address it. Great. Thank you. I know we had to end it on that, right? The four letter word, as you said, Joey. <laughs> well, thank you uh, again for all the questions and engagement from uh, um, the folks on the webinar. And thank you to our panelists. It was an amazing uh, um, group of questions and answers and, and insight from your perspective. So thank you for that. And before I hand it back over to Zach, um, I'm going to close this out by mentioning some key resources uh, that can help you along with your um, cloud journey. All right. So with the Imagine Grant, being able to support uh, work like Dr. Botka talked about um, work and why AWS created that Imagine Grant in 2018, the goal was to fund the nonprofits, nonprofit healthcare organizations who are using their expertise in cloud technology to solve the challenges in their space. Um, the grant has um, three category or two, sorry, two categories. Uh, the grant funds mission moving projects with the Go Further Faster Award and the foundational cloud projects with the Momentum to Modernize Award. And this month we announced the launch of a new award category, which I kind of let that go when I said three, sorry, um, but it is the Pathfinder Award. And this award provides up to $200,000 in cash funding and a support from experts at AWS Generative AI Innovation Center 
nonprofit healthcare organizations using generative AI for large scale mission moving initiatives should apply today. To give a sense of what our 2023 winners are up to and to help you get the idea ideas flowing, I'm happy to share a few examples. You can see some of the logos on the screen, um, but the first one is Orbis International. Uh, it, they are expanding their AI-assisted technology to millions of people in low-resource areas to eradicate preventable blindness and vision loss globally. The next one is um, our Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center is designing a cloud-native um, analysis and information management system to accelerate research while fostering collaboration using cutting edge cloud capabilities, the system unites innovative research in preventing and eliminating cancer and infectious diseases. The last one that I'll mention is the Greenwood Genetic Center. Um, they are building a unified data platform by integrating clinical genomics and diagnostic data from several systems into a data warehouse helping create a comprehensive view of patients' data to shorten the time to diagnosis and enabling personalized research to better serve patients and their families across the lifespan. And you heard a few of those examples scattered through our conversations um, uh, throughout our panel. So hopefully these examples inspire you to jump into the cloud project of your own. Um, we encourage you to download the Imagine Grant instructions. You can uh, scan the QR code that's on the screen um, and schedule a personalized generative AI briefing for your team. Our experts are here to help you discover where AWS generative AI services can add the most value to your organization, get you um, and, uh, and really hopefully giving you lots of ideas um, for possible our, our possibilities together. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for listening and answering or listening to the panel and asking a lot of great questions. Um, Zach, over to you. Thank you, Georgia. Um, and yeah, that the AWS Imagine Grant sounds like a great way to get funding to uh, to pursue, to pursue a technology project at your organization. So really grateful for the, the funding opportunity that you're providing. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Bakta, Dr. Joey, Ritesh, Georgia, for that excellent and really timely and important conversation. Uh, thanks as well to our partners at AWS who collaborated with us today on this event, as well as, of course, all of our SIS annual partners who make our entire platform of events throughout the year as possible. So thank you to all of you. Um, and finally, thank you to everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate the time you spent with us. Very much hope to see you again soon uh, and hopefully in person at our uh, flagship summit in Chicago on June 4th and 5th. So Thank you again, everyone, uh, and we'll see you soon.